Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, today we have the most awesome speaker ever, Veritunde, who's, who's hiding in the audience somewhere. See if you can spot the non-Microsoft employee. There might be some others, too, because I think uh, <laughs> the, his Mac's up here. So um, Anyway, um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Veritunde has an incredible background because he knows software. He's done stand-up comedy in New York written and directed and done a ton of stuff for The Onion, and he's uh, left that job recently and is starting his own company, um, really thinking about humor and creativity and how you can sort of infuse that into software design, and he has a, an awesome book. So we are so lucky to have him here today. Um, who are you? I know you're out there somewhere. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. I know software. It's great. Good afternoon, y'all. How you doing? Good. I heard there are 150 people on the internet version of this talk, so they're kicking your asses. We gotta get. <laughs> we gotta fight the internet people. We have to win. Uh, it's very good to be here. I actually haven't. I've never been to the Microsoft campus before, uh, so thank you for providing sun for me today. It's very lovely. I live in Brooklyn, New York, where it's raining. I just think it's weird. I had to come to Seattle to enjoy this. You know how to roll out the red carpet quite well. I'm going to talk about uh, a whole bunch of things that are going to culminate in blackness. So if blackness makes you uncomfortable, uh, now would be a good time to opt out. <laughs> and then we'll take down your name and your ID number. <laughs> Send that to central processing. <laughs> uh, let me uh, do a bit more of, a, of an introduction. I uh, co-founded a political blog called Jack and Jill Politics. It's a black-oriented U.S. politics blog. Our logo, as you will notice, is a watermelon. And uh, it's obvious, you know, watermelon signifies intelligent political discourse. <laughs> so if you saw any other kind of correlation, you have a problem, that should be investigated, again, at Central Processing. Uh, I've lived in the future for a brief amount of time. I hosted a television show on discovery science called Popular Science's Future Of. It was three years ago, we did a full season, 10 episodes, future of sex, future of play, future of pleasure, which always troubled me that pleasure and sex were in separate episodes. <laughs> I don't like that future, I'm supposed to. Oh yeah, that's me. Uh, in the future, black people wear wetsuits. <laughs> so just one, two, three, I'll put in an order for like 10 <laughs> wetsuits that should cover the building. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, so yeah, so that, that, was a, that was a lot of fun. I did get to travel around to companies and universities uh, and play with their gadgetry and sometimes their software and then opine lightly on what it might mean for the future. The horizon was 15 to 25 years. How might we live? Some of this R&D came to fruition. Uh, so that's fun. And I worked for four and a half years as director of digital for America's Finest News Source, also known as The Onion. Director of Digital is a title I made up because it sounded great, and it's DOD, and it has a very like, intimidating sort of Defense Department uh, kind of consequence to it. But what that job really meant was helping tell our story in emerging digital platforms in meaningful ways, right? Not using them merely as means, but as part of the storytelling process. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'll do a bit of a a roundup. I'm not just going to talk about the book because that's not as much fun for me, uh, but I will talk about storytelling in general and we will get to the book. So if you want to be a little bit blacker, you're in the right room. just have to wait uh, until we get to that part. I, I believe in community service <laughs> and uh, a lot of people you know, have these give back programs. Like What I like to do uh, is use my powers for good and there's a series of uh, quite horrific novels known as Twilight. They are uh, the end of America as we know it. <laughs> and then they've become more popular uh, in the form of a, a dastardly film franchise. So what I do is on opening weekends for the Twilight films, I sacrifice myself. I go to the theater 
uh, Friday or Saturday at the latest. I sit in the back with my laptop and a wireless card, and I live hate tweet the film. Uh, what live hate tweeting means is I tweet about the movie with hate, uh, which is to say I tweet about the movie because the hate just comes really naturally for such a, a terrible, terrible messaging campaign. So I will ask questions that, uh, that other viewers may be hesitant to, <laughs> things that really get at the heart of the unexplored matter. Uh, and then sometimes, I don't know, have any of you ever been in the position of being a teacher of any kind? Like, raise your hand if you've taught. That's, wow, you're all teachers. There's something weird about that. I love it, though. That's, you're <laughs> cheap. Okay. So you then will really understand that sometimes as a teacher, like you want to reach everybody, but you're not going to. And you know you're not going to. So you go for the one. This is one kid. Like if you can just get him to stop eating donuts constantly or like just get him to study a little bit harder, just get her to like turn in that report, like to go to college, to graduate, to get the certificate. You've made a difference. I had that happen to me because I prevented one person from seeing this dumb, terrible movie. <laughs> and they were able to redeploy those economic resources into more productive areas of the American economy, uh, which is good for all of us. So, Boo Twilight. Uh, I did write this book, it's called How to Be Black. It's got a very simple marketing message that I just <laughs> boiled everything down to. If you don't buy it, you are a racist. Uh, that's just a scientific fact. I'm not really trying to be judgmental. I don't make up the rules. I just enforce them violently. Uh, and then this work uh, became a New York Times bestseller. So the guilt trip, uh, very effective. Anyone marketing anything? I know Office 15 is coming out soon. Maybe you want to try that. <laughs> you don't download it, you're a racist. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, I want to go through a few things uh, during my tenure at this place. Uh, I played a number of key roles. <laughs> Uh, at The Onion, this was my most significant contribution. <laughs> sure, I helped develop iPad apps and digital strategies and pricing models, but that playing Cooter Obama was just the role of a lifetime. Uh, and hell yes, y'all can. I just hope he doesn't come back and ruin things uh, in 2012. Cooter is a hard, hard man to keep pinned down. Uh, Onion has covered media in some interesting ways. This is one of my favorite recent stories. Huffington Post employees sucked into aggregation turbine. Uh, horrified workers watch as colleague torn apart by powerful content gathering engine. And, uh, and one of the things, so when I talk about like digital storytelling, one of the, the, the overall premises is like you have these new platforms emerging. You have your social media stuff, you have your new devices and smartphones and the boring way to use them is merely to distribute the old media on top of it. It's like, I'm going to post a joke to Twitter. That's not necessarily Twitter comedy. It's funny things happening on Twitter, but there's a deeper way to do that. And part of what I was able to learn at The Onion is help us adapt that voice to these emerging times. The Onion was born as a print weekly periodical at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Went online much earlier than most actual news sources uh, in 1996. Is involved in books and podcasting and video. And the process of creation there has been very deliberate. You know, it's been around for 23 years, and there's kind of a two-week cycle to produce the issue. In the high-speed, real-time content world uh, of streams, that doesn't always cut it. And so when you have, uh, for example, the death of an iconic figure like Steve Jobs, that may call for a reaction. In the previous version of The Onion's Life, you just wait or not do it, depending on when the publication was. But now we have faster means of doing things. And I want to show you a little behind the scenes of how this newsroom reacted through its satirical tone to the death of uh, this, this business and technology leader. This is a screenshot that most people in the world will never see. It's kind of the behind the scenes of jokes that were pitched to run when Steve Jobs passed away. You have things like Apple shuts down as a man who handmade every one of their products dies. Uh, Steve Jobs released Apple shareholders. Fuck, 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 fuck. Uh, Apple store employee acting like his fucking dad died. And what we ended up going with was this very true sort of poignant, so funny, but it's kind of dark, last American who knew what the fuck he was doing dies. And so you pack in a comment about the economy and American culture and, you know, this very successful, overly successful symbol. Uh, and, and human. 
Uh, we also reacted very quickly to this scenario uh, about a year ago. <laughs> and that to me, that, was a, that, that touched a, a deep nerve because uh, this guy's an asshole. Uh, <laughs> and it bothers me that he still has purchase in this world. Uh, when the president released his birth certificate, I actually did a, I couldn't find, personally, I couldn't find any humor in it. I was pissed. I, was, I thought this was a dark moment for the presidency, for the country. You can have someone who's been vetted by the Secret Service and the Senate and the whole campaign apparatus, and you have significant numbers of the public saying, I'm not sure if you're one of us. That's just an insult to, to everything, to the, not just to, that, to, to President Obama, but to the presidency. And then the fact that this man, moments later, came out and he was like, oh, I'm so proud of the work I did, but I, I need to see it for myself. Donald Trump said he wanted to see the president's papers himself. It's like, you arrogant bastard. Uh, so I, I was very proud uh, of this organization for coming up with a comedic uh, and accurate portrayal. Uh, I will point out for the record, uh, Mr. Trump has not yet provided any documentation <laughs> to prove his humanity. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, he is that thing. Uh, live coverage is, is a fun thing that we uh, help push the envelope on, and I'll show you some examples. So uh, we have a very fragmented you know, media world. We, we went from three channels to hundreds to infinite when you get to places like the internet. And so our ability to gather around common cultural reference points is much harder today than it was 30 years ago. That water cooler has become virtualized. And you know, online chatting spaces, your Facebooks, your Twitter, but especially Twitter in this case, uh, become that coherent moment, especially around events. So you get the Super Bowl, you get the Oscars, you get the VMAs or anything like that, State of the Union. And I had been doing my own live tweeting of events and using the hashtag to kind of ride the wave. And while I was watching the Oscars several years ago, I saw Queen Latifah on stage. I think she was presenting an award. Now remember, The Onion had this piece about Queen Latifah, sort of. It was a photograph of like a generic looking African prince slash king. And the headline says, uh, King Latifah returns for queen. <laughs> I was like, that's hilarious. I'm gonna release this right now with the hashtag to kind of jump into the conversation. And people responded instantly, like, yo, the onion, that's really great. So then I started, whenever other prominent people were on stage getting awards, getting nominated or presenting, I would search our website, find the piece, post it out through the onion Twitter account, add the hashtag. And so it was sort of live tweeting, and people were like, yo, The Onion's live tweeting the Oscars. This is crazy. This is cool. And we weren't really. We were like live archive searching and republishing. <laughs> but that's less sexy. It's the mouthful. So yeah, we were live tweeting it. And then the traffic exploded. This is a Sunday night event. We never had traffic on our website on Sunday evenings. I went in, talked to our editors and the rest of the staff. Like, look at this chart. Look at all this love we've gotten. Look at the new followers we've done and we didn't have to write any new shit. Like this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Like recycle journalism. It's like journalism. So we did that and had a lot of fun with it. And then we started planning for it. This is a screenshot of uh, the State of the Union. This is kind of again behind the scenes of how we started intentionally plotting to do these things. So we would write some jokes in anticipation of sort of conditional circumstances. Well, when such and such happens, we'll say this. If such and such happens, we'll say that. We had our archive and evergreen material that's often super relevant because it's written in a style to last you know, several years. And then we had people you know, in their homes or gathered in a room doing real-time material about what's because the unpredictable moments. You, know, you have uh, someone falters on the State of the Union or on the national anthem or you get a weird shot of someone in the crowd, you're going to want to say something about that. So we organize these in spreadsheets uh, and kind of time them out. This is an Oscars one where we kind of got the whole run of show that I think Gawker had published, had a very love, lovely and loyal unpaid intern kind of codify all that and come up with a clean enough syntax so we could break it apart. And we have, okay, here's the award, here's the presenter, here are the nominees. The red ones are the things that actually won. Fire joke, which is, still couldn't be automated. That was just me pressing publish. Very advanced system. The Super Bowl is one of the hardest ones because sports, crazy things happen. So you're writing for injuries, for interceptions. You're checking your emails and your IMQ to see what else is flowing in. Uh, and you wanted a balance of like which teams 
what part of the game are you commenting on? Is it just the game? It's also the commercials and the endorsements, the announcers and the crowd, the fans. Uh, so all that created this well-rounded sense of like, hey, this is how we could cover an event without ever being there, uh, without being actual journalists, but still having some quality commentary uh, on the thing, a new way of telling a story. The previous way would have just written an article after the event, maybe one before, Super Bowl watch guide sort of thing. This is much more engaging for the writers uh, as well as for the people on the receiving end. Uh, and these were the analytics that we were looking at in some cases. This is a back-end view of Twitter's analytics. They offer people who spend a lot of money on promoted trends. And so we would take some of the best of those and then put those on Facebook, which is a slower space. You can't publish 100 things to Facebook in six hours. You will lose people uh, because that is annoying. Uh, and this is a, this is a story that uh, we did last fall that I think, again, speaks to this theme. We had uh, published a, an alert through our account on Twitter, witnesses reporting screams and gunfire heard inside the Capitol building. We were trying to break apart the story and kind of roll it out the way an actual news organization would with all the intensity and suspense uh, that that would entail. Moments later, updated Capitol building being evacuated, 12 children held hostage by a group of armed congressmen. Uh, and then we, you know, we started running everything with the hashtag Congress hostage. Uh, we got <laughs> our photojournalists uh, in a great position uh, to cover this, Jim Boehner, uh, Speaker of the House, holding a gun to a, a little American girl's head. And that's just, just linger on that for a while. It's very troubling, <laughs> troubling images. And so we continue to push the story out, adding commentary, adding coverage angles. Uh, and then we actually got some footage from inside. And I just want to warn you, these are disturbing <laughs> images. Nobody move, you're all gonna die! Hey, Boehner, this kid's got a phone. <laughs> disturbing indeed. So that happened. Uh, and then we continued to kind of push the story out. President Obama inserts himself into the situation. Uh, this quote that he issued that day, I know this Congress well, trust me, they will kill these kids. <laughs> I think that's pretty credible coming from the President of the United States. Uh, he would know. He would know what they're capable of and not. Uh, and then we resolved this journalistically with the story, hostage negotiation talks stall in Congress, which is sort of a meta-narrative on the whole scenario, the inability to get things done. I don't want to over-explain the joke, but that was uh, clearly a point we made. And then there was a bit of a backlash from the media. Uh, this was run <laughs> under the Capitol Police actually investigated uh, us. And, and there was a quote, I don't think it was in this story, it was hard for me to relocate it, but I, it did exist. There was someone from the Capitol Police commented to a reporter that we, um, we alerted uh, the Congress that this was just a hoax. And I just, I want to slow down on that concept for a minute. The Capitol Police alerted Congress to the fact that Congress had not indeed taken children hostage. <laughs> That's how broken our system is, that that had to happen. Uh, and so we got other things, you know, Onion tests satire limits with fake report. Is it too far with Twitter satire? Uh, all these questions and I think what disturbed me about this reaction from certified journalists was that the reason many of them were so upset is because they had been retweeting The Onion's posts, and especially that first one. And they were like, you can't, you can't, this is irresponsible journalism. We're not journalists, first of all. This is, this is, we're making things up. <laughs> like we've been doing forever. Like we never report. It's expensive, as you are finding out. So they were feeling a bit on their own heels. They, they jumped the gun and re retweeted this stuff. And then the backlash was, well, you got to clarify that this isn't real. I mean, you know, DC's had terrorist activities. It's too soon. It's like the clarification was the fact that it came from the onion. <laughs> That's all the context you need. Like journalism 101, know your sources, you know, um, and, and act accordingly. So our editor drafted up this response, which is one of the most beautiful things I've ever Scene. Uh, I was thinking that we could say something about how irresponsible it is for the news media to report on something that the news media is reporting on <laughs> irresponsibly. 
and that Twitter is ultimately to blame and should start censoring tweets. This just goes to show how dangerous free speech is when in the hands of reporters. <laughs> so true. Just the whole scenario is quite dysfunctional. I think we come out looking like the heroes uh, that we were. Uh, the other uh, sort of fun example for me is kind of opening up the process in different ways. And this applies not just to a place like the Onion, it applies to any institution that has built up a level of credibility and incumbency uh, and reputation. You want to give all that over just because it is the sort of way of the moment to involve your audience as, as co-creators. But there's a way to do it that's kind of interesting. And, and it revolves around this story. Uh, Planned Parenthood opens $8 billion abortion plex. So we ran this story almost exactly one year ago, as you can see by the dateline. It was in response then to the Congress having budget fights and saying when a defund Planned Parenthood comes up every year. And so we decided, like, let's just show what the stakes are. Now, this is what Planned Parenthood plans to do with a, a ridiculous sum of money. And that would have been the end of it. But then in the fall, you know, the Susan G. Komen Foundation had its flirtation with the uh, disaster. And a congressperson, a man, a member of Congress, posted this story to his Facebook wall. He's like, see? This is what they want to do. This is why we fight. And that was so very dumb, you know? <laughs> and disheartening. Like, the more you think about it, like this, I get sadder. Like, at first, I'm like, that's, oh, God. <laughs> he funds things and defunds things and, like, approves war uh, and can't discern a story that fits his pre-existing view of the world with something that's pretty obviously satirical if you pause for 10 seconds to question every piece of that headline, uh, which he just couldn't find it in his heart to do. So that would have been the end of it, but it wasn't. Uh, one of our readers <laughs> went a step further. This was not part of the plan. This is not part of the plan. They created an abortionplex venue on Yelp. <laughs> and they didn't just create it like randomly. They studied the story. They adhered to the details. It was in Topeka, Kansas in the Dateline and article, so they put it in Topeka, Kansas. They rounded it out. And it wasn't just like one person who thought this would be fun. Hundreds of people, 282 reviews for Abortionplex. It's probably higher now. This screenshot is months old. Uh, and then people got really into it. This is one of the lengthier reviews, broken down into pros and cons. Uh, the rock climbing wall. <laughs> yes, this is the largest rock climbing wall that I have ever seen. I opted to skip it, but my companion climbed it and thought it was awesome. Uh, so fully immersing themselves in a world that we only partially sketched out, they're going to keep running with it. And so the, uh, you know, there, were, there were others, uh, the salsa bar is to die for, uh, would have been five stars if it wasn't for the 18% gratuity. <laughs> We drove from Dallas. The Shell gas station next door has 10 cent a gallon discount to out-of-staters. We'll definitely be back. <laughs> Too many stairs. All right. People are just running with it. Uh, and while it's certainly true, I think, that it took the sort of considered and deliberative process to plant the seed, the growth you know, could come from hundreds of different directions from a community that was unleashed without asking permission. Either. And so there's something mildly terrifying, but also clearly inspired and truly hilarious about it. So it was like a growth and humbling and sort of educational uh, experience all at the same time. Uh, we did a story about the return of Osama bin Laden from the sea where he was buried. Uh, we got this shot and uh, you know, kind of rolled that out in a similar way. That was a shot in New York City. We lost five uh, photographers trying to get that angle. It's very, very difficult. We sort of had, again, different perspectives. And then we asked people, 500-foot bin Laden was the sort of meme that we were pushing. And then we asked our audience, have you seen 500-foot bin Laden? And, uh, and they had. Uh, this was a great uh, shot that we got. Uh, but then someone in Boston was like, oh, no, he's here, and kind of took the art and did a weak but you know, passable Photoshop job showing uh, bin Laden in their part of the world. Excuse me. So. Here's what I, I want to get to uh, in addition to all that. There is a, a lesson learned in sort of not just copying and pasting 
from InDesign into whatever the new digital thing is. There's a lesson learned in opening up a little bit. There's also one in adapting the story to the platform. And this is, we're, getting, we're getting closer to the black part, but not quite yet. Uh, I was, uh, was and am a pretty big Foursquare fanatic. And several years ago, I was mayor of a place in the Nolita neighborhood in Manhattan called Delicatessen. I'd been mayor there for many months. Things were peaceful. My people were happy. Uh, all was quiet until my mayorship was challenged by a friend who did not respect my authority nor the success uh, of our territory. So she challenged me to a mayoral battle. She's like, I'm going to take this mayorship from you. He's like, you won't. A drunk friend instigated the fight even further. And we decided we're going to treat this mayoral campaign like a campaign. We're not just going to, it's not going to be just about checking in. We're going to have all the accoutrements of a political movement around Foursquare. And we did uh, a number of ridiculous things during this process. First of all, we were there pretty much every day. Uh, the only odds she had of beating me was because I travel. I'm here, for example. And so when I'm out of town, I can't be there. So she can kind of creep up on me. And for those of you who use Foursquare, you know that it shows you how many days away from mayorship you are. When we did this, that was not the case. So you had no polling, basically. You didn't know where you were with respect to your opponents. You just had to assume you're about to lose at any moment and punch it. Uh, she ended up coming up with her own drink uh, at this bar and named it for the campaign. I followed suit with my own drink, which was whiskey-based. You can still buy it there. It's called the Whiskey Thurston. Uh, and then I went, I made t-shirts that you can see me wearing right there. A company called Apiary did that pro bono for the campaign. We declared it on our contribution forms for <laughs> transparency. It's very important in politics. Uh, and I held a rally for my campaign, and I just want to show you this uh, ridiculous video clip. But my name So yeah, that happened, uh, and the, I didn't get this part on video, but we walked into the bar, which was right across the street. I didn't want to do a rally right in front, because I thought, one, that'd be too disturbing. People might think I'm actually protesting it, and I'm not, so I did it in front of a business I disrespected. Uh, <laughs> it was like an Ed Hardy shop. I was like, I hate you so much. Uh, and so I walked in, and this dude was very upset with me. Uh, he had witnessed this whole thing. He was like. Who the hell are you? Why are people following? What are you, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm just trying to you know, have some fun, trying to tell a story in a weird way. He's like, but how much is Foursquare paying you for this? I'm like, they're not paying me anything. It's just like an art project. What, how much is Delicatessen paying? Foursquare owes you reparations for this. And I was like, I don't think you mean that word. <laughs> I think you're thinking of a whole nother word. But thank you for your passion. You know? He's like, he's like, but you're not, you're not curing age, you're not doing anything, you're nobody. And I'm like, well, clearly I'm somebody. I got 15 people with signs. But the point was like, let's explore this and let's get off the screen. Let's get into the physical world. This campaign was a lot of fun. We got our friends to come out and meet us more often. And so often these social tools are designated as uh, isolating, antisocial, uh, tech only. But there's people behind all that. And then we sort of had a fun time uh, exploring that. Also, there's some backlash. <laughs> Uh, whenever you go out with a political message, you get some haters uh, on the other side, so to speak, and uh, that was fun. I conceded the race. I won't show this video. It's not, it's kind of gratuitous at this point, but I lost the race. I didn't think I could. I was very arrogant, 
but I left town one time too many. And this was on a Sunday in the final sprint week of the campaign. And I woke up with a choice to make because one of my friends was running for state senate in New York, like our actual campaign that mattered with real consequences other than who eats cheeseburger spring rolls for too much money. So I decided, let me go up to the Bronx and canvas for him. And then I'll come back and have like a late brunch at Delhi later in the day. And as I had just gone through my training, I was headed out the campaign office to go into the community, I got the alert that I'd just been ousted as mayor of Delicatessen. It was a very sad moment for me. Uh, but it was also, it was beautiful. You know, it was beautiful because I was doing real stuff uh, in that moment. I thought it was perfect that that was the moment that it happened. I was like, okay, let's, let's actually do the real thing now. Uh, and not just play at politics, but do it. This man, Gustavo Rivera, who's in the lower third, he won. Uh, we, my team out canvassed everybody else that day. I think I was just motivated. And he ended up ousting the most corrupt member of the New York State Legislature at a time when that legislature was dubbed the most corrupt in America. So I had a small part in ousting the most corrupt actual senator, even as I was ousted uh, in a sort of satirical version of that campaign. Also, I was not corrupt. I was noble. <laughs> I serve my people quite well and with honor. Uh, we're not gonna, it's, it's, it's too sad to revisit that. So I wanna talk about the book and, and how all that kind of informs this. I wrote this book, as you know, it's called How to Be Black. The way the book started in some ways was because of Twitter and because of a real world interaction. I live in Brooklyn, I had been going to buy some wine and I didn't know how to do it. There's a way you're supposed to buy wine. You like pour it and then you swirl it and then you almost snort it uh, and then you feel things. Or you have these emotional reactions like ennui and nutmeg and oak happens as a verb to you. Uh, and I didn't understand all that. I haven't read the books. I'm not, it's just too much effort. I like it or I don't like it. And I didn't want to ask the clerk for help because that would involve learning something new. And I'm pretty solid with what I know. Like I've been alive for a while. So, I instead looked for a sign from the bottles and the labels, and I saw this brand of wine called Negro Amaro. I was like, that's it. That's the wine for me. It's got the word Negro in it. <laughs> Clearly it's for a discerning, yet ignorant and lazy black consumer. <laughs> and so I bought this wine. It was delicious, a very pro-black wine. And then a few days later, as the bottle was emptied uh, by my hand, I tweeted out to my friend Elon James White, he's a fellow comedian, also from Brooklyn, also black, and I said the following, uh, this weekend I picked my red wine because it was called Negro Amaro, that's how black I am, how black are you? And so he responded uh, pretty quickly for 7.30 in the morning, I see the subtle racial implications of Thundercats, Panthro is black, shirtless, and lion -O's driver, how black are you? And so we, we were going back and forth dozens of times, and this is public, so other people are jumping in on the hashtag and offering sometimes salient, sometimes highly disturbing and ignorant <laughs> commentary on this open theme. I ended up talking about this at a web conference. A publisher from Harper Collins was in the audience. We ended up having a conversation, and in that meeting, they said, you, sh you should do a book. What about how black are you as a book? I was like, what about no? <laughs> that is a terrible idea. I don't trust Twitter with that, much less like all of America, which doesn't acknowledge the Americanness of its black president. So uh, instead, we came out with how to be black. And it was more of an assertive statement, it was more of an offering rather than a challenge to someone's legitimacy, which is not any way that I wanted to kind of label and brand myself for all eternity or until you know, we destroy ourselves in a nuclear holocaust. Um, and so the, the book was you know, supposed to be these several pieces. It started a satire, you know, how to be the black friend, how to be the next black president, how to be the angry Negro, how to be the black employee. Uh, but then it also got uh, more investigative to a certain degree. I asked questions and invited submissions from people. Uh, the book itself has chapters that are based on questions. I assembled a black panel of experts. These were people who had been black their entire lives. And so to have a, a wealth of experience to draw from. And I asked things like, when did you first realize you were black? Right? How black are you? I had to continue that theme. Have you ever wanted to not be black? Can you swim? Uh, 
very important question related to black identity. And, uh, and I ask this of, of six black women, six black men, and one white man as a scientific control group. I, t <laughs> I told you I'm a scientist. Like, this is not judgment. This is evidence-based. Uh, and I got the whitest guy I could get my hands on, who was Christian Lander, who did stuff white people like, both the website and the book. So he is a white Canadian <laughs> in this book, uh, of, theoretically about blackness. Here's a trailer, uh, not a trailer, here's a, a slice of the interviews that I cut together to then offer the public a chance to engage. So I came home and I remember I couldn't really move past the entrance of the house and I need to talk about the fact that this little girl said that I was black and that I in fact found myself to be beige. I was playing doctor with a bunch of kids and uh, and this one girl, it was her turn to kiss me, and she didn't, and she sort of ran away laughing, and the other kids ran away laughing, and the thing I realized at that point that, that I was black and they were all white, because this was a small private school in Boston, and that was the first time I remember feeling like black was somehow separate from the norm, you know? I think I knew I was black before then, because as I say in my show, my mom would not have let me not know I was black. <laughs> there would have been no way that she would have let that information slip. Uh, it's cold outside, take a jacket, and you're black. I was born in Africa, so everybody's black. <laughs> so we don't really think about it like that. I mean, here you go, like, yeah, I mean, oh, so is he black? Is he white? Is he black? Is he black? black, black. In Africa, like, you don't ask. The assumption is that you're black. Therefore, what becomes more important is other things. What your name is, where do you come from, what language do you speak, what's your culture, what's your tribe, etc. So I know I was black. When I was eight, I moved to the Middle East. I think the Middle East is the first time I discovered I was black. Because people would come to talk to you and they'd be like, oh, yes. And what does that translate to? That means, oh, this is a black guy. <laughs> I grew up in East Chinatown in Toronto. So it was made very clear that I was Guaylo from a very early Guaylo being white ghost. So, you know, I, I know every derogatory term for a white person in Chinese. By the way, a little more background on those, some of those people. Uh, Cheryl Conti was the first person. She was my co-founder at Jack and Joe Politics. She runs a firm in the Bay Area called Fission Strategy, social media for social good. Kamau Bell, great comedian from the Bay Area, has a show coming out on FX this summer called Totally Biased, produced by Chris Rock. Christian Lander, still very white uh, professionally, doing a, doing a great job of it. Derek Ashong was the host of The Stream on Al Jazeera English recently left there to pursue music full-time, uh, and Soulfej is the name of his band. They're doing a million download campaign to get people to, to give away a million tracks and use that to kind of promote their career and, and rise on the live and the merchandising and, and things. That is so racist. <laughs> that phone, specifically. It's 2012, people. We got a half-black president. We can't, it's, it's a dark day. So, um, so we did that. You know, the book it has that kind of embedded, that conversation is part of the piece. And then we went out into the world you know, and, and offered people uh, a chance and asked more questions. When the book was released, uh, we built the site on Tumblr, which is already a kind of conversational platform, the submissions and the ask question feature. We offered a question every day for folks to answer. Just like in that video, examples of that were how we started it and said, whatever your race or background is, like you probably felt an outsider or some resonance to these questions, maybe been asked to represent all your people at some point uh, in your life, in a meeting, possibly here, maybe, uh, you know, provoking that response. And we also had some great images. Uh, this was a photo shot by Neil Brennan. Neil is half of the team that created The Chappelle Show. He co-created that with Dave Chappelle. I had the honor of meeting him, gave him a book, because I was like, who wouldn't? And then he went into the New York City subway and was surrounded immediately by these dudes. 
and uh, their facial expressions <laughs> kind of cover the range of reaction <laughs> to the book. You know, the guy on the left is kind of like droopy-eyed, falling asleep, kind of confused by the whole thing. The guy, you know, on, just to his right is really intense, like, there's some good stuff in here, I'm learning. Uh, the guy to his right with the do-rag on is like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and then the brother on the right is just fully checked out. He doesn't need it. He's a professional. He's been black his whole life and no book's gonna tell him anything he doesn't already know. Uh, the photos, you know, this book is a billboard and sometimes, you know, people catch folks in the wild with it. This was shot at a Starbucks in D.C. and uh, this woman had fallen asleep with the book on her head, I like to think she was using the osmosis method <laughs> of learning to see the world through different sets of eyes. So that was, that was lovely. Um, and so, you know, community didn't have to mean crowds. So I, mean, I, I did a, a very extreme thing where I, in the closing writing phase of the book, which is last summer, I opened up the process for anyone to see. I called it live writing. It was, I shared my screen with a so the software demo, QA support kind of things, join.me was a service I used. And anyone can see what is exactly on your computer screen. And so I did that uh, because a friend suggested it and because I'll try anything once. And it was fascinating to kind of open up this process, writing very personal memoir type stories, writing some satirical bits, and people just jumping in wherever they could. And the reaction, there was a chat room that was attached to the software. I had to mute that ultimately because it was becoming too distracting. There's also a feature which lets people request to take control of your computer because it's really a software demo thing. And so people kept trying to take control of my computer. Like, I want to write something. It's like, no, you're, I'm still the author. Like, it's still my book. You can watch. This is a witnessing sort of uh, event. But I did look at the logs of the chat room after. And there was some really interesting commentary like this one, uh, like that, gives me a connection with the author. How self-obsessed does one have to be to set something like this up? Very, very self-obsessed. Love myself. Uh, just a little I've read here makes me want to buy the book. Score! This is good. This is the opposite of my live hate tweeting of Twilight. I guess generated a sale. Uh, I have the urge to tweet about this. Now you're on the marketing team. Congratulations. This is great. Volunteer street teamers. It's inter interesting to see his writing flow. This was unexpected because you never really see people write. You, you know, you see them write, but they're probably at a distance unless you're creepy. And you just see someone at a computer, but you don't really know what they're doing. And so to see a page go from like zero characters to thousands was very educational for some other writers. Uh, this person <laughs> was surprised to see me use semicolons. That's like a weird form of punctuation racism, I guess. Uh, so again, we have a black president. I feel like I can use a semicolon without criticism. And this was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Uh, my girlfriend is Chinese, and I'm half Jamaican, half regular black. I think our kids might end up Dominican or something. There's a lot going on in this statement. And uh, let's just start with regular black, shall we? Let's just deconstruct that concept. When I first saw that, I'm like, is there, is there diet black? Is there black zero? Failed experiment at Black Clear, a la Pepsi. Um, and then the idea that your kids end up Dominican, I, I mean, I get it. It's sort of a racial mixing, you know, skin tone reference. But I kind of hope their kids come out like loving baseball, mofongo, and speaking in the Latin accent. Like, I would think that would just be a weird outcome because you put something on the internet. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, this is a world that, that we're building, whether it's the stuff at the Onion, whether it's this book, which is the world of conversation about race and identity that is ongoing, that I am trying to be a part of and roll forward and carve out windows into it through a print book or an e-book, through some tweets, through the Tumblr, through Facebook. That's uh, kind of the point, is to open up windows into that world, and that's kind of the way that I sort of think about creating these stories. Also in the future, uh, we're all going to be Dominican. And, uh, and so what I'm doing now is kind of taking that premise of immersive multi-platform storytelling, of using humor to deal with really awkward concepts like race and identity and divisiveness, politics, uh, and that's my new thing. That's the, the job that I have, and I'm creating this company called Cultivated Wit, which will use as a sort of mission statement and operating premise this opportunity. 
Uh, and so I'll take the opportunity to stop talking and open it up. We have how many people are on the internet right now? 191, kicking your ass. <laughs> Real people, you know what? You know what they don't get? Watch this. <laughs> Boom! Oh! Oh my God, look at that! Oh yeah, take that! Internet! Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> what? Where's the camera? Where's the camera? <laughs> but yeah, we have some time, so let's, uh, you know, you have questions, feedback, commentary, uh, hatred, more cell phone ringing. <laughs> yes. Wow, he's standing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> can we get, can, just for my purpose and the judgment of your peers, can we get your name? My name is James Mickens. I'm black like yourself. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I want to say thank you for coming here. Yeah. Uh, seeing a black guy in Seattle is like catching a Pokemon. This is a very... And so I sort of want to start a dialogue with you. Let's just pretend that these other non-black people aren't here. Okay. <laughs> just like talk right now. Uh -huh. you know, I come to work every day. You know, I talk to Sal. I talk to Todd, I talk to Jane. I don't talk to the Marvelous, you know? I don't talk to Shane. What is your strategy yeah. for dealing with the constant oppression of the white hegemonic power structure? You know, <laughs> do you shout into a pillow? I mean, what, how do you deal with that yeah. constant psychological tension? Yeah. You know? And just speak as if we're alone right now. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the first date. So here's what you gotta do, brother. Okay, yeah, All I like right. to whisper about this. This is serious. <laughs> Get yourself some nunchucks. <laughs> All right. You'll never suspect the nunchucks coming. <laughs> I have a chapter called How to Be the Black Employee. Sure. And it is a sort of a simulation where you are the black employee, whoever the reader is, and I kind of walk you through some of the rules uh, of what that means. So the first thing you have to do is sort of identify all the other black people that might be at this company. Because you've got to figure out what that relationship is going to be. Form alliances. Yeah, or understand that they will not be formed and act accordingly. Because sometimes, right, there's an alliance there. There's people who are looking out for you, who kind of see themselves in you, may want to be a mentor. Other times, they're just haters. Like, they were the one before, and now you ruined their monopoly. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and you're breaking up, bringing competition to the market. Uh, or there's people who just uh, like, really don't have any sense of race as a part of their identity. And that's useful to know, because if you try to approach them on that angle, they're like, no, I'm just, I'm just James. What is this black thing you're talking about? Uh, have fun with, with, your, with your white people. Uh, <laughs> torture them. Not physically, Jesus, people. <laughs> Wait, they're not here though, right? Nunchucks come in very, very useful at this moment. But I would say, you know, the, the scenarios do play with it. Do kind of push it and try to be comfortable. It can be so weird in some of these circumstances, always being asked to represent explicitly or implicitly everybody who kind of looks like you. Or you say like, I'm black like you. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're black very differently from me. I've got hair up here. <laughs> For example, you got a goatee going on here. We are both wearing hoodies, that's true. So we got that red shoes, black shoes. So there are three differences between us. Uh, and we should exploit those differences. Uh, it's a maximum division uh, and effect. So what I'm hearing is yeah. using my blackness as a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> can I quote you? In you can definitely quote me on that. <laughs> I, I would say, though, uh, in a little bit more of a serious tone, like the playfulness is kind of important because what I, like I worked in a corporate environment for eight years. I was a strategy consultant in Boston. So there's trauma there. Uh, and what I, you know, sometimes I would assume that the oppressive white hegemonic structure was an active thing, and it wasn't. It's not, no one was really out to like, get me, get me. Maybe one person was, <laughs> but I got him first. <laughs> Nunchucks. <laughs> but it was more of like, just not knowing where to come from, not having any experience that was related to mine, so just lots of awkwardness. And the lack of ill will and ill intent is important to account for. Right, the assumption that you're not out to get me, even as you sort of get me accidentally with the weird questions you're asking, that does a lot to kind of lower the temperature and lower your sense of like paranoia. Because people really probably don't care that much about you. Ultimately, and I don't mean to reduce you as a person, but I'm saying like, you are different, obviously. You're, 
<laughs> you gotta come with me everywhere. This is good. I'm having a really good time with this. We, we can't show weakness in front of the whites. They're not here, remember? <laughs> They're on the internet. Ah, we didn't block out the internet feed. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so you know, making that assumption of not even not goodwill, but not ill will, maybe no will, will kind of help you control your own reaction. Joking around with it with those you're comfortable with, making sure they never say the N-word. Uh, those are important as well. The last one is very important. People get too comfortable. Internet question. Yes. Um, he says, Ben says, you do a great job coming up with new ideas for generating buzz. Some of these are bound not to work. What's the penalty for bombing? And how many times can you fail and have people still take you seriously? How many times can you fail and still have people take you seriously? What's the penalty for bombing? Never failed. I've heard of this word, <laughs> failure, yeah, no. The penalty is uh, a lesson, and obviously not achieving that particular goal, but I don't, I don't think it's a reason to not do things. Like I, I think it's sort of, not that it's an irrelevant question, but there is a penalty for failing, and keep trying stuff. Uh, as long as not everything, if everything fails, that's really depressing, and maybe you should try something else. Uh, but I think, and then in terms of maintaining, not losing people or, with the, can you rephrase, can you repeat the last part of the question? He says, how many times can you fail and have people still take you seriously? Seven. Seven times. Yeah. <laughs> the eighth time, you're done. You just gotta, you have to actually pack up your family uh, and leave, preferably the country, uh, or go to like a lunar colony or something like that, where no one knows you. Uh, no, there's a, there's no number, obviously, but I think the failure itself isn't the, f the full problem. It's maybe how you approach it. Like if you're failing and being fake, if you're failing and being exploitative, if you're failing and being condescending or disrespectful and not respecting the community of people you're trying to connect with, then that's a more problematic form of failure. If you're failing and you shot the moon on something you really believed in that should have worked and didn't, people might still be there for you. Uh, but other than that, seven. Lovely hair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you may have covered this. Um, I was late. So that's how black I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I'm really interested in knowing is sort of your career journey. You mentioned that you did strategy in Boston. Right. Um, I'm an aspiring writer. Um, used to publish a lot. Wrote for the Amsterdam News when I was 15. Cool. Um, mentored by people like Kevin Powell. And um, had to do the corporate thing, yeah. started a family, I'm trying to get back into writing now, and so I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey. Yeah. Took a bus. <laughs> it's everywhere. A lot of good stories on buses. I grew up in D.C., uh, born in 77, left in 95, went to Harvard for undergrad. Uh, my neighborhood was basically the wire set, a single mom, some stereotypical urban blackness elements to my story. Some non-stereotypical, like I have this African name, not Nigerian at all, just the name. Parents couldn't go back to Africa, they brought Africa to us uh, by labeling me Baratunde. And, uh, and then I went to Sidwell Friends School for uh, 7th through 12th grade, and then Harvard with a philosophy degree. When I left there, uh, I thought I was going to be a teacher, some sort of technological entrepreneur, or uh, what was the other thing I was going to do? I can't even remember. Oh, a journalist. Journalist. And I had a roadblock for some of those. I developed RSI, repetitive strain injury. The summer I had an internship lined up at a major newspaper, had to bail on it because I couldn't type. Can't be a journalist and not be able to type. So I did theater that summer instead. And that clearly had an effect on some of where I ended up. But when I graduated, I didn't go straight into the arts. I had to go into loan repayment. So I joined this consulting company. Uh, and it wasn't even as bad. I mean, now it's terrible. I would hate to be graduating from college right now. Woo! Sorry if you have kids doing that. Uh, sell them off, really. <laughs> Probably get a better return. Um, but I, I did that for a year. This, this firm focused on telecom and media, and they were kind of born out of the Telecom Act of 96 with all these new competitive phone companies trying to figure that out. And these guys were positioned to do it, and I loved infrastructure because I was a big nerd. I was like, I want to know how the internet works. Switches, yes! And I left, I left after a year to start a venture capital company which was dumb because it was the summer of 2000 
and the whole thing had just burst, but I didn't know because it was bursting around me. So this is a great time to forge off into my own with no savings. And I did that for like six or seven months, had fun, made no money, went back to the consulting. Temp for a while, then went back to the consulting with a sense of freedom. Because I'd quit once, it's kind of like dying. Like once it happens, if you remember it, you're like, you're not afraid of it anymore. And so with quitting a job, which is a very empowering thing to do, I no longer feared it. And I just, I worked harder. I took all the lessons to heart. I knew what was BS and what wasn't. I was fine with it. And I basically worked in that world full time for another few years and then part time. And what shifted me was uh, I started doing comedy again in 2001. And this was after my first year back. I took a class, my girlfriend at the time really convinced me to get back on this creative path. Took a writing class, commuted to New York every week for a comedy writing workshop. Took a stand-up comedy class, Boston Center for Adult Education. And that was the nudge that I needed to find a new rhythm. And I still did the job by day, but now I had a thing by night that I really cared about. Took all the money I was making and just sort of plowed it into that. Whenever I travel for work, I do an open mic in the town, started blogging again. It was, I just needed to take that first step and then the walk became a little easier. So for years, I was cultivating this artistic and more political life subsidized by Verizon, BlackRock Capital, whoever the clients were that I was working for until I reached critical mass of opportunity. I moved to New York in 07 because it was too easy to make the money from the corporate life and I found myself making perverse decisions about what to do with my time that weren't serving my creative side. So physically removed myself from the situation in New York, comedians, TV, publishing, everything I wanted to be more of was there more. Kept the job remotely, but within three weeks of moving to New York, found this opportunity at The Onion as politics editor. Applied, got it, many, many interviews later. Took a massive pay cut, but it was not even, there was no flinching. I did do some financial modeling <laughs> on uh, what, you know, before they made the offer, I was like, okay, here's what I'm making now. This is good. I can like subsidize two people, live in a decent apartment way uptown. This is what I think they'll come in at, which is like significantly lower. This is the bare minimum I need to survive. That's what they came in with. I don't know if they hacked into my system or <laughs> something. It was really interesting. It was like to the dollar. I mean, it was round figures. It wasn't like pennies involved, but. Uh, so that was it. And once I got there, then I was on a new platform. And I kind of shifted my foundation from, oh, strategy consultant stuff to, oh, works at the onion. And then that presents a different face to the world, different set of doors swing open once you fully moved. Um, so that's, for me, it was not a dramatic leap of faith into the world of starving artistry. I still had loans to pay and I wasn't trying to be so dramatic with my life, but it was a steady discipline and a balance between, okay, how can I use this to enable this other thing? And over time, just pump out enough work that I could create my own buzz, create my own voice, like find it. And I could only find it by talking a lot. Uh, and that's so I went from full-time in consulting to part-time and then to, to no time. Yes, sir. South by Southwest a couple years ago, you did a, a riff on uh, Black, black tweets and Twitter as a black social network. Could you talk about that? I, I mean, it's still available on the, on the web. It's pretty yeah, black people are still on Twitter. It's true. <laughs> it's still available. Um, yeah, I did this talk. It was actually it was a precursor. It was right around the time I was signing the deal for this. So I think I called it How to Be Black Online was the, the title of the presentation. And people were really obsessed at the moment about black people being on Twitter, uh, which I was not obsessed with because it's like, oh, yeah, we're also people. And we do stuff that people do, like tweet and eat. Like black people drink water, it's crazy. Let's write a story about it in Salon. Uh, so I'll partially I'm dismissive of the over-investigation and like anthropological poking uh, of black people just doing normal things. Uh, what I was focused on at the time, and I've really lost focus on that since then because I, I don't find it as curious uh, a question, but there was the reaction to these black trending topics popping up amongst the early Twitter community is often negative and awkward and ugly and a little racist and certainly strange at a minimum. 
And it was similar to Hunger Games. And y'all see the movie, Hunger Games movie? Okay, you heard about it. <laughs> okay, I just want to, maybe you work really hard here and don't know there's a whole world of passable movies being made. Um, actually, Hunger Games is pretty good. It's pretty good. So there's a character named Rue in the Hunger Games, uh, in the book and in the film, and she's black. She's cast as a little black girl in the film, and there were some people on the internet, which is to say people, who were upset by the, the fact of her blackness. It's like, oh, I love the Hunger Games. Then they ruined it by making Rue black. Ugh. Why'd they have to? And so someone found all these tweets, uh, the darkest crevices of ignorance on the internet, and said, let's make a, a story out of this. And there were two problems with it. I mean, obvious ones, right? It's okay for a little girl to be black. That should be fine, not a crime. But she's also black in the book. <laughs> right? So you're wrong on like the basic facts, as well as the, the attitude that you're carrying around. And so, but that shock of like, how can this black thing exist in this world that I see every day, which conforms to what I am? There was some parallel there between that and like some of the reactions to faces and themes and names that we don't understand popping up on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is much more different because it's, it's open. And like a lot of conversations that have happened, you just never saw before because you weren't physically co-located with that community. Like people are in this shop talking this way, people in the street corner talking that way, people in the boardroom talking that way. We, those worlds were physically closed to us before, and now everybody can just jump in. You can search for banana and see how people talk about banana all around the world. It's fascinating. So that, there's some disappointment for, on my part in the reaction, the negative reaction to some of that. There's an, also an understanding that like, if you have built a world, not even built consciously, you just exist in a world that looks like you all the time, which is the way most people in America live. We're actually not that integrated a society then it will be a shock to your system and a telling one in how you react to it when you say, oh, this is a problem. Like, oh, Twitter's ruined now because black people are on it. Hunger Games is ruined now because they got to put a black character in it. It's like, well, it's like saying gays ruin marriage, right? It's like, you still have your life. You can still be you. They're not actually all up in your face, you know, interrupting your ability to, to pursue your dreams uh, as a member of society. There, I had thoughts. So, I, first of all, I love the idea. Cool. It's absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Uh, you, on your radio, the whole thing, uh, podcast, whatever. Uh, but when I read it and when I listen to it, I I get the sense of a white voice hmm. behind it. And I know that comedy is funny, and then it's funnier, and then it's hilarious, and there's this little line, and then it's painful and embarrassing. So I wonder if you ever found yourself in the position of being the guy they went to and s to say, is this okay with black people if we do this? And how you handle that? Yeah, good question. I was shocked at how little I had to do that or was ever asked to do that or felt that I should do that. Uh, the Onion is white, heavily. When I arrived, I was the black guy. There was one before me, but you can only have one at a time. <laughs> so we gave Dap in the hallway as he left and I entered. He was like, it is your job now. <laughs> we passed off the nunchucks. Uh, so that was, his name was Brandon. He was a graphics editor and he worked heavily on the Our Dumb World book. Great dude. So yeah, I came in with uh, you know, some maybe lower expectations of like how this crew of mostly men, mostly white, mostly from the Midwest, could speak to or identify with, relate to uh, people who, don't, who aren't like them. And I was pleasantly surprised that that wasn't really a thing. I don't think I've ever got asked, what do black people think about this? Are we gonna be all right here? I may have volunteered that perspective once or twice in four and a half years and thousands of stories and imagery and art and things like that. Because what, the first, that room is very uh, difficult to get things through. So just the, what's an example? Ashton Kutcher. All right, let's do this. Yes. He did an ad for Pop Chips that some of you may have heard of. Raise your hand if you have not, if you do not know what I'm talking about. Good for you. I'm about to ruin your day. 
So uh, Kutcher did this ad for Pop Chips where he played an Indian Bollywood sort of single man about town. He dressed in traditional-ish Indian garb. He wore brown face and he affected a shitty Indian accent. And then proceeded to talk about, you know, how pop chips make him get the ladies or something. This is also shortly after his divorce, very public and a horrible separation from Demi Moore. So lots of reasons he shouldn't be doing stuff like this. Mostly brown face, uh, which should be an obvious thing. Like somebody in that room should be like, yo, maybe we shouldn't do the brown face thing. Maybe we, we get like, there's like a billion of them. Maybe we got to cast a brown person. That's crazy. Why don't we employ a brown person? No, no, I'm going to do this brown face thing. This is art. And so he did it and looked very stupid, and the ad was pulled, and it's embarrassing. Uh, that wouldn't happen at The Onion because the comedy rules are so uh, enforced. Like, say something original. Say something that matters. Say something that's funny. At least two of those three things have to apply. And so a lot of nonsense that in another type of room you might be like, why was there anyone there to stop that? Just never made it out of the process because someone was there to stop that. Uh, so that's one. I think they're also, the writers there just do a ton of research. Sm you ever read Smooth B? All right, so Smooth B is a, an editorial columnist character. He is straight out of the early 80s. He's got like kind of a jerry curl parted here with three tracks in his hand. It's just, it's all about the ladies with Smooth B. Smooth B is written by a large Polish man. <laughs> named Chris Karwowski, who is also the one who does on did Onion Radio News for so many years. Chris is hilarious. Chris put himself in the, in the character. Chris owned it. And, but you would never expect. I show you pictures of him and, and this movie character. Like, how did that come out of that guy? And so I think there's a level of kind of respect for the material and immersion that is maybe a little bit more rare than, uh, than not. I'll think a little bit more about it, but I don't... I don't have those types of war stories coming out of that place, despite the fact that I was the only uh, Negroid for so long. Oh, right. Okay. Wow, way to cut me off. <laughs> I'll sign over here.